one of the co-leads here for Ladies That UX Atlanta. Um, and I am a UX copywriter at HUGE. And that's enough about me. We're going to get into the speakers. And um, yeah, we're going to introduce everybody that's going to talk to us tonight about paths of careers and strategies and all that good stuff. So um, yeah, so I guess we'll start off with Kiana. Like, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you, and we'll go from there. Um, hi, um, I'm Kiani. I am a qualitative UX researcher at Pinterest. Um, I've been there since April of this year, um, before I worked at usertesting.com for a few years as a UX researcher as well, and I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Thank you, Kiani. Sorry for mispronouncing your name. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. And so, and Christopher, you're up next. Hello, everyone. I'm Christopher Harness. Um, I am a product director at Career Builder. Um, I do want to um, have this one little disclosure. I do work for Career Builder, and um, I will be making some statements tonight about some of the research that we do, about some of my experience. But all that experience is based on my personal experience and not a direct endorsement from Career Builder. I, I say that not because my company asked me to say that, but just because this is about you and your careers. And I want to make sure that you guys know that this is coming from a personal experience and not from my Career Builder experience. I'm very happy to be here with you and to share as much as I can and answer any questions that I can about how you can grow in your UX career. Awesome. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you for that. Um, okay. And then next up, we have Carol. You want to jump on and introduce yourself? Excellent. Hello. I'm Carol Smith, and I, uh, I'm i in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so I'm not as far uh, south as the rest of you, but uh, I uh, work for uh, Carnegie Mellon University, and I'm in a research group that's actually consulting. So we do consulting to the federal government and work on robotics and artificial intelligence and, and other complex systems. And uh, I'm on the research uh, side of things, and I've been working in user experience, uh, human computer interaction for 20 years across a lot of different industries. I've managed groups, I've consulted, and, and now I'm in academia. So I've kind of covered all of that and happy to share um, what I can with you. And I also teach uh, graduate and undergrad students. So I, I am familiar with the student experience as well now. So it, not to mention, obviously, I was in school once, but <laughs> I'm looking forward to a great conversation today. Nice. Thanks, Carol. Happy to have you. Um, and then last but not least, we have Jen. All right. Hi, um, I'm Jen. Um, I am currently working um, at a federal contractor called A1M Solutions, and I um, have been there since March of 2020. Uh, so that's been interesting. I've never met any of my coworkers in person. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I am, um, I just started last month on a new project. Um, so I've moved from being the design lead on a very small, very startup-y kind of project to a very large, very complicated um, HCD unification project in government um, over a big division. So um, kind of living the career progression thing right now. Um, but I've been in UX since 2009. Uh, I've had a long and winding path across a bunch of different industries. Um, and kind of, kind of, kind of love where I'm at in the in the civic tech space now. Nice, thank you, Jen, and thank you all for the introductions. We're really excited to have you all here, and yeah, we'll just get started. We'll just jump into the questions, and this is a really casual, you know, conversation. So we're excited to hear what you all have to say. Um, but yeah, so I guess we'll start. So the first question that I have. What, and I'm, I have a second monitor over here, I'm sure you guys are aware, but my questions are here so I can see you all here. Um, so what skills did you develop in the beginning of your career that remain key to success in your current role? I'll go. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that I, I take with me and I have taken with me throughout my career was something that I got in high school and not in college. Um, I, I was in this course called PALS. Um, it's Peer Assistance and Leadership. Um, and basically, you learn how to counsel your, your peers. And um, today, I still use those skills. 
Hold knowing on. how to be empathetic to people, knowing how to listen to people's problems and really understand where they're coming from and their perspectives will take you so very far um, through your UX career, obviously, but even when you go into management, um, you'll be able to use those skills. So uh, definitely, you know, something that, you know, I take back from, you know, high school, my senior year, um, you, you have skills that you will have throughout your life. And it doesn't have to be things that you acquired through school, through, um, or excuse me, through university or through boot camps or any other um, courses of study. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think a lot of the skills, it's, it's been things I've picked up at a very young age, um, really wanting to understand uh, and look at the true needs of, of people and, and really being uh, you know, not wanting to just look at the superficial, the, the easy path, but, but really like what, what's really going on here and, and doing the questioning. I was in a very similar program and, and it had a big impact on me uh, as well, just really talking through things that the benefits of really talking to people and communicating with others and really understanding where they're coming from uh, and, and respecting that difference. Uh, is something that I learned very early and, and uh, it's, you know, even more important and should have been important all along, but, but even more so um, it's lovely to see more and more people realizing how important that is and, and talking about it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Kiana. Are you going to? Yeah. Um, I would say a good skill that's helped me um, in my career is just always being curious and always constantly asking questions and wanting to learn and grow. Um, I feel like in UX, it's always changing, it's evolving and just always just going out there asking questions, always being curious and just constantly being open to learning new things is so important in UX. Definitely sounds like there's a theme here, like communicating and just being curious. And what do you think, Jen? Yeah, the communicating is really, um, really a big one. Um, I think the like skills that I can like, really name like early on were um, being a really great writer, being able to do that communication through speaking and text um, was a big deal and, and being able to kind of think on your, think on your feet. I, I think we get asked a lot of weird questions sometimes and being able to come up with a quick answer is important. Um, but also the power of the community, um, just like getting involved. I got involved really, really early, um, which was good. Cause like when I very, very, like after high school and I was, um, I, I like knew how to write HTML. I like made websites and I had no idea that it was a career. You know, and it took me a really long time to actually like figure out, oh, wait, I can actually, that's what got me my first role in tech was just being able to write like 90s style um, HTML. But, but it, it, that being part of that community helped me quickly not get into situations like that again, where like I had this awesome skill and I didn't know what it was, you know? And so I was able to just learn from everybody really quickly. And I think that's so important, even at the very beginning. Absolutely. Yeah, that reminds me of those angel fire days back in back in the 90s. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all for, for that. Um, so that brings me to the next question. So how would you say that your definition of success has changed over time, if it has at all? Um, and yeah, like, I, Keon, or, go ahead, Carol. I was going to say, mine definitely has. Uh, I um, was much more uh, preoccupied with titles and, and uh, in leadership roles uh, 10 years ago or so than, than I am now, um, primarily because I, I tried those out and, and the uh, influence isn't always what it appears to be on the outside, uh, unfortunately. Um, and so really looking for meaningful and impactful work that I can do regardless of title, like looking for working with people I like, people who uh, respect me, who really value the work that I'm doing and the contributions I'm making um, is much more important to me now um, than working for a particular organization or having a particular title. I would like to piggyback on that because Carol, that is a huge point and something that I also um, definitely agree with. Um, today, the human connection uh, at work is so much more important to me than the title. Um, we all like want to work for the Apples and the Googles and the Amazons because you hear that big name, 
but you will value so much more the connection that you have with the people that you work with, being able to go to work every day and enjoy being there, being able to be speak freely to your manager and know that you have a really great working relationship. Those are so valuable to you. And a lot of times you don't get those at, you know, large corporations. I'm, I don't have experience working at Apple, so I can't tell you what that experience is like. But I can say that I've met many people in many different industries who've worked for large companies and they have similar experiences um, where, you know, it's not all that it's, you know, cracked out, to, cracked up to be. I do see, and I wanted to make a comment about this um, in the chat, lots of people talking about, um, you know, not being able to make up your mind and moving from, you know, decision to decision or, or changing majors or, or whatever. And I'm going to tell you that that's not a bad thing. Um, one of the things that and, and to, you know, that you need in this industry is diversity in your in your thinking. And having that broad experience, that broad range will take you a long way. So don't feel any kind of way about, you know, not being able to make up your mind where you want to go. Explore as much as you can because your path will will guide you. Um, you will get on this path and on this journey and all of a sudden you'll realize, you know what, I really like that and I'm, I'm going to keep doing this. So, you know, just keep exploring and you'll, you'll find your way. Awesome. Yeah. And what about you, Jan? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Gosh, my definition has changed so much. I mean, when I first got in, it was like, I literally was like, I just want a tech support job. I don't know what I'm going to do. I just know that's going to get my foot in the door somewhere and it's going to be amazing. And, um, you know, I got, I, I got a little bit caught up in the, like wanting to climb the ladder thing. I was like, yeah. And, and part of it was like, for the sake of all women, like I'm going to go be like an executive somewhere. Um, but I do oh, have gotten close to that and I don't like that. Um, <laughs> and I mean, there's, I, and I think with, with the, with like the big name companies, there's something to be said for a moment. Like there, I, I worked for a company, you know, I worked for MailChimp and like that name got me places for a while, you know, for a while. And, um, it's okay if you want to go do that. Like, go try, go try it out. You know, there's there's nothing wrong with wanting to go to the big names. But I think my my experience with it was similar. Like, okay, I went there, I did the thing, it was great. Um, and now it's so important, like you said, to have those connections with the people, um, people that you work with. Um, one of the things that for me is kind of the opposite that a lot of people have. I I am actually a stickler about titles um, because in my first job, we were like, no, we don't do titles. And then I realized it was actually hard to um, prove who you were to speak at conferences. Um, it was, you know, there, there's a little bit of clout to a title if you have that desire to be a little bit public, you know? And I've also noticed that when I would work at startups, like the men would get the titles first. And then I would say, hey, um, they got an actual title. Can I have an actual title? Or am I still like, you know, the, I don't know, whatever, whatever weird support rock star or UX, whatever, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but um, so I do like, a, I do like a nice title, but at the same time, none of that matters if you're not working someplace that is like, for me, it's the excellent work. I want to work on a team where I can do excellent work. And that to me is, is super, super important and kind of my North star now. <laughs> I hear that. Keani, did you want to add in anything to that? Um, yeah, I think it's similar, like piggybacking what everybody said um, at the beginning. Um, I feel like I grew up in the era where it's like in TV cribs, driving the fancy cars, making the money, success, the titles. Um, but as I started working, it's been more about making a positive impact and making sure that the work that I'm doing means something. So success, that's what it means to me now. It's like it has changed as I've gotten older. Yeah, that's awesome. It sounds like it's it's mostly about just like having that personal connection and being attached to your work in that way, opposed to just like making all the money. It seems like that's the common thing here. So that's that's great. Um, okay. So have you ever dealt with imposter syndrome? And if so, what advice can you offer to help someone? overcome the feeling of not being good enough? I can start. 
with that because all the time um especially like when I start, first started working at Pinterest I feel like I'm still I'm approaching mid-level but more of a junior researcher and working at a bigger name at Pinterest um I'm around a lot of talented smart people and when I first started it was like oh my god am I gonna fit in here am I good enough but the way that I overcame that is in any role that you're in, you have to remember that they hired you for a reason. There's something that you bring to the table. Everybody has their own set of skills. Everybody is different. We come from different backgrounds. If you get that role, there's something that you're bringing to the table that makes you special and valuable. So you have to remember that you're there for a reason and that you're awesome. So that's how I get over it when I'm sitting here like, oh my God, I don't belong here. But um, you have to remember who you are. It's like, remember who you are. That's like what you have to do. And you got to be like your own cheerleader sometimes. Yeah, and I, and I think there, there are two sides to it. So I, I do certainly have, have you know some similar uh, feelings regularly, um, particularly when I'm putting out uh, you know a statement about something, how I feel about something. It's hard not to feel like, oh, you know, are they gonna, you know, I'm wrong, or you know, am I am I not thinking about this enough, that sort of thing. Um, but on the other side of this. Uh, is the fact that it, sometimes you're absolutely not seen as the person with the experience because there is uh, bias, racism, sexism, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I do think that, that it is oversimplified uh, often to be called imposter syndrome when it is not the person who is uh, putting their ideas forward or, or, or presenting themselves. It's uh, the environment and the people uh, who are, are uh, you know, demeaning and, and playing down their ideas that that's the problem. And, and then they internalize that. So it's kind of a, uh, it can be created by the environment, I guess is my, my response. I, I, that's a really great point, Carol. Thank you for that, because I suffered from that myself in my career, um, internalizing, you know, being, um, put down at work. And it's not necessarily that do people do it like intentionally or that they even realize that they're doing it, but it does happen. And you start to ask yourself or question your abilities or, or should I be here? But in addition to that, you know, and, and it, it, it's a trauma, by the way, and for all of you to, to recognize that that is a trauma that you deal with at work. Um, but on top of that, like I spent, you know, the first half of my career being self-taught. And for me, that was a huge insecurity because I felt like maybe I don't know enough or I didn't go to school to study this. And so maybe I didn't learn the right things. Um, but I, I, I finally I went back to school and I realized that um, I was actually better than most of the people that I worked with or that I went to school with. And um, I would learned so much. But the one thing that I did not learn um, outside of school, and this is some advice that I would give all of you is you know learning design vocabulary that will take you a long way because what it does is it gives the person that you're speaking to the interpretation that you know what you're talking about um, and that was the thing that i was missing is i know the reason why this is you know it's supposed to be this way but having to be able to explain it and use the right design language to explain what i'm thinking um, that changed my life and it really elevated me to a completely different level. So I, I will um, share a book with you guys um, later on. I shared it the last time that I spoke with ladies at UX um, about design language, but um, there's plenty of resources out there and I would definitely recommend that that's something that you learn is how to speak design language. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. I've, I've heard a lot of people speak about that. Um, just to be able to have a co casual conversation about this thing that you're really excited about and that you do, you know, and, and just being able to speak to it is really important. Carol, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to add on. I, uh, I actually have a very uh, challenging time remembering certain terms and I uh, had to learn completely new terms when I came to CMU because I went to a different school for grad school and had spent my whole career outside of this, uh, this world. And uh, for those who it's more challenging also forgiving yourself for, for not <laughs> recognizing every single term and also realizing that everything has five names in this industry. So um, it, yes, it, it's a, it really important to be comfortable talking about, be familiar with as many terms as you can be, but also 
you know, don't kill, you know, don't uh, be angry at yourself because this one term you didn't recognize and, and ask people to clarify because, you know, <laughs> because uh, it, it's really difficult. Three people will call the same exact method, three different things. And the three people will use the same exact words to describe three different things. So if I said that right. <laughs> Absolutely. Cause it makes total sense. Yeah. Everything has five different names. Truth. <laughs> Jen, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Yeah, I, the terms thing really uh, struck a nerve with me. I like somehow have powered through my career just like tripping over terms constantly. I just try to do it as real talk as possible if I don't know what it is, you know. Um, but but yeah, that's that's a big one. But I, I think for me, the I I get I get imposter syndrome around feedback sometimes, um, and I really have to think like if I'm getting negative feedback, like okay, does it actually resonate with me? Like, do I recognize that as something that I struggle with or that I've uh, done, you know? And there've been times in my career where I've definitely had feedback that was like, no, I'm pretty sure that's not true. <laughs> like, and then I, I realized where that's coming from, you know, as I got further in my career is like, people always have a lens when they're giving you the feedback too. So I just always try to know like, okay, I'm going to hear this feedback. Am I accepting it as something that resonates with me or something that I think someone maybe isn't understanding, you know? And um, that's, yeah, that's where it, that's where it comes from. But I'm, I'm obnoxiously um, like sure that if something needs to be done, I can figure out how to do it. So I just like power through, like if I'm feeling like, okay, I've got to do this thing. I've never done it before. What am I going to do? I'm just like, whatever. I'm just going to learn how to do it. I'm just going to do it. And um, I don't know. I know that's hard. I know that's super hard to do just powering through, but like, yeah, sometimes you just have to Christopher, we need the details on this book. Like you went and got it. You're holding it up. Like, give us, give us the deets. So I'll open the book up just so you can see, like, um, there's a lot of um, things like repetition, for instance, and it gives you a definition of what repetition means um, in design. Um, things like, um, let's see, informal structures, um, you'll see. <laughs> um, and so it's very simple, simply written, um, but it also is wonderful as far as, you know, being able to just speak design terms and to understand design concepts. And the other thing that I would, you know, recommend is, you know, just learning the principles of design, um, the, those basic principles of design. You can you can go to boot camps and you can learn about UX and things like that, which I suggest you do if you want to, you know, get started. But those basic principles of design, um, the, one of the things that I like to do is give talks about like the foundations and why the foundations are so important. Um, and so the, the, those foundations, no matter what you're doing in UX, will take you forever through this, you know, no matter what methodology you're design you're using, if you're using agile, if you're using um, waterfall method methodology, no matter, you know, what technology comes around, um, whatever is going to change within this industry, those foundations will always be there. So the principles of, of design, learn those and also learning some good design language. Awesome. Thank you. What, what was the name of the book? And like, who is it by? It's called Visual Grammar, and it's by Christian Labor. Okay, awesome. And I think someone put a link um, to uh, maybe the book in Amazon on Amazon in the chat. Oh, cool. So thank you for that. Thank you. So that can actually like lead me to this next question. Um, what's one piece of advice that you would give someone who is like working in their first UX role or looking for their first UX role, and they're not sure of you know, where their career path goes or, you know, what they should do. Like, what's, what's some advice for that? And whoever wants to start can jump in. I, I can jump in on this one. I, 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 one of the things I wish I'd had when I started was more of a team. Um, it, you know, I kept ending up in these like one person UX places. And so I was, trying to learn it all and didn't really have people to bounce off of. So like early on, if it speaks to you, like getting into a place where you're going to have a team and you're going to have peers and you're going to have people that you can learn from, like um, I've seen a lot of people have success with that, but also you don't have to have it all mapped out. Like try to find something that interests you, excites you, fits in with whatever your 
skills are at the time. Um, I think when you're first starting out, I have mapping, mapping your career path is going to be like, know what your values are and that will lead you at least through the first parts of that map. Thank you, Kiani, what, what about you? Um, I agree with um, Jen. Um, I would just pick an area if you're not completely sure, because you can, there's so much, there's so many places you can go in UX, you can pivot, you can change your career. I would just pick a perspective, pick something that you enjoy doing and you can always switch it up if it's something that you, you see something that you're more interested in. I know when I worked at Career Builder, I wasn't so sure exactly where I wanted to be in you. I knew I wanted to be a researcher, but I didn't know if it was quant, qual. I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. I would sit in in sessions. I would ping Christopher, ask him questions when I was confused about design things or Havana. I asked a lot of questions. I would sit in design crits. I would just, you know, really try to figure out where I wanted to be and just really exploring and picking people's brains and just trying something out, I feel like that can help you kind of guide to where you want to be. I was going to actually mention you in my response, Kiani, and I was going to say that, you know, if you're interested in, in doing something in UX and you don't know where to be, that research is a great place to start because it will allow you to get to know the products themselves or what people are designing, but also get to talk to users and to understand how people use products or software. Um, to get to get your feet wet and to really um, kind of ask those, get, get to asking those questions. Um, I also wanted to um, touch on something that I'm as I'm looking in the chat, I'm just responding to um, some of the questions there. Um, how do you know if you know enough to get an entry level position? Um, I, I cannot ex ex um, express the importance of um, the portfolio. And you don't have to have this majorly, massively huge portfolio in order to get a good job. But a portfolio is also a great opportunity for you to practice at, in your profession. Um, putting together a body of work and showing yourself what you can do uh, is a great way to understand, do I know enough? Whether it's you going into visual design, whether it's you being in interaction design or in research, there's always a portfolio uh, that you can put together of the work that you've done. If you don't feel like you know enough, then keep practicing, keep adding to that portfolio. So once you feel like you have enough, then you know enough, you know, uh, you'll, you'll build that confidence level up. Um, have people review your portfolio, uh, you know, people that you don't know, strangers, reach out to them um, to look at your portfolio and give you uh, constructive feedback, not just, you know, feedback, but constructive feedback about your portfolio. Yeah, that's like, that's, Awesome. <laughs> Jen, did you want to add anything to that or just different things that you should do? Like when you're thinking about going into a different role or, oh, Carol? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I agree with what everyone was saying. And, and also, especially if you're more of a researcher, not worrying so much about how the portfolio looks, you know, make it neat and professional. Um, but not uh, worrying about the design. Uh, the, particularly if you're interested in research, I want to see your messy stuff. I wanna see how you transform some ugly, sketchy thing into something that was more usable um, and how you uh, did that work and the story behind it and why you pick the questions you picked if you were interviewing somebody and, and what you did. I don't wanna see a bunch of pretty final products uh, that's, that's not a researcher. That's not a researcher's portfolio. It should be uh, stories and uh, progress, uh, caterpillar to butterfly. I, I wanna see what each of those stages were, what you learned along the way, why you changed something, what happened. And that's why you can do this stuff um, on your own. You don't need to have a professional job to, to make some of these portfolio pieces. You do need spare time, which is a whole nother issue. I, I do understand that, but, um, but you can assign yourself to improve an app that you hate or love. You can assign yourself, you know, and any type of project like that, and then go back to it in two years and do it again, um, because this work is never done. <laughs> There's always more improvements to make, and uh, you can show that in your portfolio and show your growth and your thought process and what you've learned. Can I just add to that, Carol? 
Um, when you said that, you know, you need free time, obviously. Um, when I was in design school, one of the things that we were taught to do was to copy, you know, another artist's work in order to get better. And so if there are websites out there that you like, if you're learning HTML, for instance, that was what I did. I went out to websites and I was like, let me see if I can redesign that. And I would actually spend hours like trying to recode the site just from looking at it to see if I can get it just perfect. Um, if it's, you know, visual design that you're doing, see if you can do that. Like I, I, I I'm broad <laughs> in, in my experience, but I also would get into Photoshop and I would get into Illustrator and I'm like, I'm going to see if I can recreate that. So if you can, if you can do that, then you can use the software. Um, and so you, you know enough to be able to be a professional and get out there and do some great work. So get out there and copy. Don't don't feel any kind of way about it. Get out there and copy whoever and see if you can um, put it together yourself. Thank you, Christopher. And Jen, did you want to piggyback or add to that? Yeah, I think I was trying to think like what's the what's the most number one feedback I give when I'm reviewing um, when I'm reviewing resumes and I send it back to, to the recruiter or whoever is, I just, I don't know how this person thinks like in the roles that I'm doing, they require like, um, you know, generalist stuff. They require a lot of facilitation. They require a lot of people management skills. And it, like Carol was saying, I want to see that messy. I want to see how you process that hard thing you had to do. Um, like, I, I don't, I don't want to just see the pretty pictures not in a UX role. Like if I'm doing a, you know, if it's a visual design role or something like that, yeah, put all the pretty pictures on there. I want to see it, but like, I need to know how you think, how you're going to speak to people, how you're going to speak about yourself will be a really good indication of how you might speak to others um, and how you might treat them. I think that's, that's, you can, you can tell a lot from how somebody writes in their portfolio. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that kind of leads me. So we're going to have one more of our kind of pre-planned questions, and then we're going to start taking some questions that we've been getting in the chat from the audience. Um, but speaking of portfolios, you know, what do you do or how do you handle when someone criticizes your work? Um, you know, and, and like, what advice would you give for a designer who is having trouble, like, you know, taking that criticism and and, and dealing with constructive criticism? That's a really great question. Uh, I definitely want to answer <laughs> this one. Um, my, the first um, boss that I had, um, and I, my experience, um, I worked for this Fortune 500 company and um, I was an intern. I started off as an intern and they gave the website to the intern. They told me, you know, here's a copy of at the time Microsoft front page <laughs> and here's a computer and a desk, you know, we, people they're doing this thing like the Internet and we, we need like a, a website or something. Can you can you make that for us? And so I sat at my desk and I just started trying to create this website and the vice president who was going to approve it, you know, I showed it to him. He's like, I don't like it. I don't know what it is, but I don't like it. And I'm like, that's like the worst critique you can ever get because you're just like, okay, <laughs> what am I supposed to do? But the way that you should handle, now that I understand this in my professional career and I've been through you know, many, many managers, um, is to ask questions in return. Um, when people do have critique for you, you know, and it's not even like, what is it you don't like? It's, you know, how would this be improved or what could I do better uh, about this? And don't take offense to the fact that they have bad communication skills uh, because not everyone is a great communicator and you're not going to deal with great communicators, you know, throughout your career. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's all about ego. Um, remove the ego and just, you know, understand that this person may not know how to, you know, choose their words correctly. And you ask questions back to them. You know, if I move this to this place, do you think it would be better? You know, or is it something like that? It just exploring different options with them and being collaborative with them to understand, you know, what it is about the critique. 
And also getting to know a little bit about that person's personality helps because it helps you understand how to talk to them. Um, because that's exactly what I had to do with this manager. I we learned that he likes you know Star Trek, and we're like, well, let's make something about space. <laughs> and it's he was sold on it, but it also opened him up to be more communicative um, when we you know could break the ice with him on the design level. Awesome. Does anybody else have anything they want to add to that amazing response? That was an amazing response. Yeah. And I, I just say, you know, take a breath, take a deep breath um, before starting to ask those questions too. And just check yourself, you know, or because yeah, you're, you're going to deal with so many people uh, who, who don't respond in a way that's constructive. And on the other side of it, um, you do need to get used to critique in this job. So, so getting used to uh, taking that deep breath and turning it into questions. I like the, the comment somebody said, you know, taking it and turning it back into, uh, you know, gathering information and, and taking it, particularly if you're um, doing usability testing, you, your baby will get beat up um, and uh, learning to, to take that and uh, take the information you learn and use that as a win. You know, I got I got feedback. That's what I wanted. Um, it it's, it's becomes a strength, but it does take time. Go ahead, Kiani. I'm gonna say um, just take feed like criticism with a grain of salt. Um, when I worked at user testing, I was a research consultant, so I was used to dealing with a variety of stakeholders. Um, some people are going to love what you do. Some people are going to hate what you do. Just whenever you're getting that feedback, just kind of listen to the feedback you're getting and take what you can out of it and apply it um, and just take with a grain of salt. That would be my advice whenever you're not liking some of the feedback because I've been criticized about the way I speak. Um, I've been criticized about how I, I do my presentations. There's been so many things that work well with some customers and then and stakeholders and some things that don't. So just take what you can from that feedback and try to improve and just take with a grain of salt and keep it moving and do your best. So. How do you speak though? Like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, yeah, thank you. Um, and definitely like it's never personal, you know, with some of the criticism and, and all of that, so. Jen, did you want to add to that or? Uh, I'm trying to avoid this question a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to say that uh, there will be points in your career where you just can't help but take something personally and you will get defensive from time to time. It'll happen and just dust yourself off. You know, don't beat yourself up on something if you if you got defensive or anything like that. Um, I mean, I literally did it this morning, <laughs> so, um, but I think it's, uh, you know, feedback's really hard. It's one of the hardest things to deal with. And so don't beat yourself up if you, if you, um, if you struggle with it. Yeah, definitely. I don't know if it ever gets like easier. It just gets like easier to, to process. So, yeah. Um, okay. Well, great. So thank you all. We're gonna start, um, we have a lot of like questions that have come through the chat and I've got them over here. So we'll go ahead and just see what some of the audience is saying. Um, so we have a question from Karina. She asked, they asked, what advice do you have for someone looking to make a career shift into UX? Where's a good place to start in terms of education? That's a hard question for me to answer um, <laughs> because I, like I said, I was self-taught for such a long time um, and I transitioned um, into UX or into this from being a language major. So I, and that happened when I was in college. So I was, I started off as a French major and um, I was an intern in an IT department. It was, <laughs> so it's, it's hard for me to answer that question, but I will say um, for specifically for Jessica, who was, um, mentioned earlier that she was a technical writer, um, I had written down a note for you that if you are interested in UX, and maybe this applies to you know others on the, the call as well. Um, also, don't um, you can also think about like if you're not good at like aesthetics or design, um, that um, search engine optimization is really important. 
and being able to use words and see how words are being used um, within the site. Being a content creator, a content writer is also very important, hugely important. Um, being uh, a um, information architect, understanding how the data is put together um, and the structures of the data. Um, all of those are, are relevant skills that you can apply to this industry. So just because you're not able to do what you used to do doesn't mean that you don't have transferable skills um, that apply to this industry. And it also doesn't mean that you know the only roles out there are visual design or interaction design or research. There are lots of roles out there. I work in product right now, and I didn't think that I would be in products you know, 10 years ago. Um, I thought that my, cre my path, I wanted to be the creative director. Uh, and I, I did that. <laughs> I became the creative director at a company, um, but I've moved past that as well. And so, you know, you never know where this will lead you, but you do have skills. All of you have skills that transfer into this industry in some way. I can uh, add to that. Um, I, I, even, I started with a master's program. I didn't know about this as a career until I happened to find the human computer interaction program at DePaul in Chicago and, uh, and started that program and then was able to fit work into my job that was more and more HCI UX related. Um, and that's, I think that's a, a good way to do that. Uh, if there is a UX department in your organization, try more and more to, to do things with them. Uh, see if you can get invited to their, you know, if they have group meetings or whatever it is and try to um, make those connections if you're in a company that has uh, that kind of work and maybe you can transfer. I've, I've had a lot of people I've worked with um, and a lot of people I've managed transfer in and out of my departments uh, as their careers progressed and as their interests changed. And that's been very successful as well. So if you're in a larger organization, that can be a great way to move into this career without even having to change your, your insurance or anything else, um, which is nice. And if you're you're not yet, then uh, yeah, just you know, I, I I always caution people about doing pro bono work because your time is worth money and you shouldn't work for free. So um, I would be very cautious about doing that if it's truly something you believe in. That's fine, um, but you know, really be careful about doing pro bono work, particularly for an organization that has money. Um, uh, don't do that. <laughs> Your time is worth money. Don't take free internships unless you're rich. Uh, don't don't do that um, if at all possible. Good things to know for sure. We'll, we'll go into the next question unless uh, Kiani or Jen has anything to add to that. Okay. Cool. So we had a really good question come in the chat from Sarah. Um, do you have advice for folks who are already a few years into their UX career, but are not sure how to determine goals for themselves for the future? Anybody want to jump in? I'm sorry. I, I was a little distracted with the chat. Um, can you ask the question one more time? Sure, sure. I apologize. Do you, no, no worries. Um, do you have advice for folks who are already a few years into their UX career, but are not sure how to determine goals for themselves like in the future? Yes. Um, <laughs> I was actually talking to my manager about this um, earlier today. Um, I, I was letting him know that I was going to be doing the speaking engagement, and he, you know, and, and the topic and everything. And you know, we've both uh, kind of been in this um, field for around the same amount of time with different experiences. Um, I'm going to tell you a story that all of you are familiar with, um, which is um, about Christopher Columbus. And when he sailed across the ocean, he charted his course, and he thought that he was going to India. And he ended up on the other side of, you know, the Atlantic Ocean. And look at where we are today. It changed the course of history. It changed the course of the world. The point that I make there is that you all have a, a horizon that you're looking at. And you think that that's where you're going. You're trying to map out this course, but you don't know what's on the other side of the horizon. And the reality is that, is that you know, the horizon never gets there <laughs> because as soon as you reach the point that you thought was a horizon line, you realize that there's another horizon out there. I, I make a broader point to say, just stay open. 
be open to the experience, be open to the journey, be open to the opportunities that come your way. Um, and, and trust your gut as far as like which opportunities you take that you're taking the right ones. But, you know, don't make choices based on, you know, the popularity of a company or the popular or how much money it's going to pay. You know, make choices based on what you really, really want in life and what really speaks to your heart uh, and be happy about it. Um, because I never thought that I would be in the position that I am in today. I never thought that my career path would take me where it is today. I, when I left high school, I thought I was going to be a French professor <laughs> and I'm so far from that. Um, but that's, I think the biggest thing that I can tell you is just stay open and, you know, enjoy this process and trust in the power of you. Um, if you guys have seen Colin Kaepernick's um, um, series, um, limited series on Netflix, I definitely recommend you watch it. But um, it really does remind you that there's an internal power that you all have. And trust in that power that you are making the right choices for you and it will lead you in the, on, the, on the right path. Awesome. Oh, your answers are just so great. So I'm feeling so inspired by you all tonight. This is amazing. Did anybody have anything they wanted to add? Kiani or Jen or Carol? Yeah, I, I like, um, I, I like having a framework for thinking about stuff like that. Like I've definitely had just random goals that popped up in my head and became passions, but sometimes you, you had a place and you're like, what do, I don't even know. How do I even decide what's next? How do I even start to think about it? Um, I, um, I'm going to recommend these two books with a caveat that it's been a long time, long time since I've used them. So um, I'm not recalling fully if there's anything problematic in them or anything like that. Um, so I do want to, I do want to say it's been a long time since I've, I've read them, but I think they were okay. Um, but there's one called the Renaissance soul. Um, how to make your passions your life. If you are somebody who is like, I love doing all the things, all the things, and I need to do all the things all the time. That's, that's kind of me. Um, that's a really good one to help you kind of narrow down what you want to be doing right now. Um, and I also really liked um, designing your life. Um, it's, you know, written by a couple of like fancy college professor. So take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it, I don't know. I found it to be a, a helpful framework too, to, to think about just to get any, any kind of framework to get off the ground. You could choose those books. You could look for any kind of framework to help you set goals. Um, there's a lot out there. And what was that first one? The Renaissance soul. Thank you. Mm-hmm. By the way, um, just a note for the attendees. Um, I know not everyone um, is great with chat and text. If you would prefer, go ahead and uh, use the raise hand feature if you wanna ask a question as well. And while you guys are doing that, uh, Keisha, go ahead and um, move on to the next audience question. Will do. Thanks, Savannah. Yes, please feel like, put your hand up if you have any questions and, and we'll, we'll try to get to them as best as we can. Um, so this next one is from um, Kamoy. At what point in your career did you feel like you were, I'm sorry, at what point in your career did you feel like you knew what area in UX you wanted to focus on and were passionate about? Any advice on how to figure that out? I feel like we kind of like covered that a little bit earlier, but if there's any, you know, different kind of versions that you're thinking of, you know, with this question specifically, we're all ears. No, I think it was covered. Yeah, okay. So here's our next question. For those of you who do hiring and have you know, been hiring people, what is something that makes someone stand out? Like when you're looking for junior talent, mid-level talent, what are things that you look for? <laughs> I, number one, I work for a company whose sole focus is on getting people jobs. So I'm a shameless plug. You guys are looking for jobs. You know, feel free to go to careerbuilder.com. <laughs> but as a hiring manager, um, hiring at all different levels, you know, entry level to senior level, the biggest thing that you can do for yourself is, number one, be honest um, about your experience level. 
and what you know and what you don't know. Being upfront with people, it, 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 it goes a long way. And also learning how to talk about yourself. Um, you'd be surprised at how much practice you need at selling yourself <laughs> for a job to talk about your experience, to talk about what you've done. Um, it, it, it takes, inter they, they call them interview skills for a reason because you build up these skills um, when you're in an interview. So, you know, do practice interviews with people um, to see if you're talking about your skills in the right way. Um, but when I'm looking for people in particular, um, I really want someone who is, you know, just honest with what they are capable of doing and open to learning and open to communicating. Um, I want to know that this person is going to fit within my team and within my environment. Um, and that means that, you know, you have the great personality that we're looking for. And that doesn't always mean that a great personality is someone who's outgoing. It means that, you know, it's someone who can communicate well and that I can work easily with. I don't have to pull things out of you and I don't have to fight with you uh, because I've ha worked with those types of people before. And I know I don't want to work with those types of, types of people. Um, but it, those are some of the things that I think really take you a long way is just being very open and honest about, you know, what you do and what you can do. And, oh, go ahead, Cam. Cammy. Um, I was going to piggyback what Christopher was saying. Um, I have never been completely in charge, but I've been part of the interview viewing process where they've asked us our opinion on candidates. And one thing that a lot of people make a mistake of is just not being their authentic self. I feel like people try to craft answers based off of what they think I want to hear. And that actually kind of is annoying. It's like, you know, don't be yourself. Like, just like Christopher said, be honest, just be who you are and tell me what you know. Like, and that goes a long way versus trying to craft answers based off of what you think sounds impressive or what you think they might want to hear. Because we can tell if you don't have experience, we can tell if you're not being who you are and that doesn't get you anywhere, just be your authentic self. Yeah, and not having experience is okay sometimes. Mm -hmm. We just wanna know that you don't know and we know where to put you. So don't worry about that. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty obvious. So just be you, right, 100%. Um, but on top of that, no one is ever going to talk to you if you don't customize your resume for the job title. Um, so if they're looking for a UXR research science person, make sure those words are in your resume because almost all the resumes are being scanned by machines and or uh, HR people who have no idea what we do at all. And they're literally looking for, uh, it says UX interaction and this says, uh, nah, it's not the same. You, you really have to work on matching it. A resume is not a legal document, but you also should never lie, obviously be very honest, but at the same time, those titles can be interpreted in the way that the machine or the human is going to understand. So make sure you take the time to do that. Otherwise your resume will never get to the manager who will then uh, talk to you about your experience. So, so make sure that you take the extra time to customize for every job you apply for that you're serious about. And 100% agree with that coming from a company who builds software that <laughs> allows employees to search resumes. So um, the things that you do here at Career Builder, obviously that it's a job search platform, but we, we're not just a job search platform. We make our money from customers who search resumes and post jobs. So that's exactly what they're doing. They're searching for terms to pull in, but we're also matching. We do a lot of strong matching um, based on your resume. And we'll look at your job title. And sometimes based on your job title, we will infer um, the skills that you have and we'll match those skills with the jobs that are out there. So make sure that your resume is up to date and that it does match with the kind of position that you're looking for because all those algorithms out there do help us match you to the right employer. Yeah, and um, I've actually been, the, the folks that I've hired for the team, the last team that I was on um, were actually all mid-level designers. And um, I knew in the position they were gonna be and they all had to level up, you know, that, there was something more I was going to need from them than they had. Um, and so I would look for, okay, what is that one thing I just cannot live without? Like I've got, you have to know this thing to be able to help me 
with the work that we, has to be done. And where can I see that you want to grow? And does that also match the team? So really it goes back to like, there are things you need to do to match your, your resume to, to keywords and things like that. But there are places, cover letters, portfolios, everything where you can say like, this is what I'm doing now. This is where I want to grow. This is, you know, like, um, that's all really important, but I do look for like one, one little thing that's like, I can see right there. You, that thing was hard that you did and you did it. And it's a little bit above your skill level. So like, I'm always looking for that. Are they about to level up kind of place for the mid-level talent? I haven't hired for junior talent, so I'm not really sure. Um, I think again, just goes back to be able to explain, you know, your work and, and talk about it, but for mid-level, you really, you really are looking for somebody who's going to grow with you, hopefully. Um, and you want to see what direction they want to want to go in. And then when you get into the interview for a mid-level position, the number one thing I am looking for when I'm interviewing somebody is, especially with UX, I'm going to tell you all about the project we're working on. I need you to ask me one or two really, really great questions about the information that I'm giving you. Like if you don't have that curiosity to, to and I always leave time, you like, I know a lot of interviewers don't leave time. So I, I get that, but like, I always try to leave time. And when I ask, do you have any questions? And you tell me, no, I'm like, I don't know if you're going to work in this position that requires UX research. Yeah. Yeah. That makes, that makes total sense. So thank you. We have time for a couple more questions. And I know that we have some hands up here. Um, so Chelsea, um, do you want to go ahead and come off mute and ask your question? Yes. Hi guys. Um, the question I had was on your resume as an entry level UX designer, I've had so many odd jobs and, um, throughout college. And then I was just an assistant before I realized this is what I would like to do. Do I put those jobs down? Do I put the Google UX certificate as experience? I'm not really sure how to tailor my resume for an entry-level UX designer role at this point. For sure, you don't need to add all those odd jobs that you've had. So sometimes people have this misconception that you're supposed to put every job you've ever had on your resume. And that's not the case at all. Kind of like what Carol was mentioning before, when you want to tailor your resume to the job that you're looking for, you still want to do that because you're going to show up in a search engine. And if all of your experience, if you're looking for a UX role and all of your experience is, you know, wait staff at, you know, Applebee's or whatever, then that's not going to be a good match for the kind of role that or the kind of position that is out there. But if you do have a Google certificate, a UX certificate, then definitely put that on your resume uh, because people are going to want to know that you have that type of experience, um, at least some background. Um, also, if you're looking for a UX role, it's it's key as far as like the keywords, because we're searching on keywords. So you may put things in there like um, interact interaction designer in training or interaction designer or learn, currently learning those types of things where you still have those words there so that you do come up in the search, but then also the person reading your resume knows exactly where you are in your career progression. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, what was that? Okay. <laughs> I said um, you're welcome, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, okay, and yeah, so one last question from Meredith, unless anybody else wanted to piggyback on what Christopher just, just said. Okay. Um, yeah, Meredith, if you want to go ahead and, and uh, come off mute and ask a question. Um, so I guess similar to that with your resume, it's like I, I'm taking a UX um, content writing course right now, but like they're also, I'm reading articles about how like Facebook just transitioned a lot of their UX content titles to like UX content designer. Um, and then there's like UX content strategy. And a lot of these roles kind of like all interplay and have different meanings to different companies. So if you're talking about algorithms on like career.com and it's this space that is like evolving and the terminology is evolving, what are we supposed to be putting on our resumes 
to express like what our skills are and the job that we're looking for. Yeah, and, and that's where you really do have to customize it. Um, so I've even updated my LinkedIn when I was applying for a job I really wanted, I changed my LinkedIn, the, the information on the titles, the information in the descriptions, so that they would see I was clearly the right person for the job, and I got that job. Um, so you need to, you know, really, um, unfortunately, do a lot of work, um, especially with all the changing titles and the confusion around that. It, it's not easy, but um, having one resume for everything is not going to get the results that you want unless you're in a really narrow and very very popular uh area and well known um if you're you know less experienced you really need to do that work unfortunately it's a lot of work so in some place like career builder would you have a few resumes listed out differently yeah i don't know how that app worked i haven't used it in a while sorry um but yeah or or swap it out and 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 you know have those versions and i'm gonna I, i'd like to speak on that and also to answer i just gave bobby um a, a response as well so this will kind of um, be for both of you um on career builder you can put up to three resumes you can add up to three resumes and you can submit either of those resumes that you want um, however one thing that i just want to you know kind of disclose to you all um, when you're thinking because you don't know like what's happening on the back end like you put your resume out there and you know you don't know what employ what's what's going on well we have thousands of customers we have em employers from all across the country that are searching our resume database and there's some person a recruiter an hr person who is typing in search terms looking for resumes so a lot of times you know not everyone is good at their job um, and the market, the way that it is right now, like <laughs> everyone's frantically trying to find people. So you may get emails from random people because they try to cold call or, you know, that, that's what the, the technical term for like just reaching out like randomly to people. Um, they're just trying to like cast their net out as wide as possible to try to get people to, you know, apply for jobs and not really taking into consideration like your particular skills. Um, it's it's unfortunate that that happens, but that's exactly you know why you might get you know jobs that may not be related or it's so, it sounds similar but it's not exactly the same because they may search for a researcher and uh, you know a hundred results come up or a thousand results come up and they're like I'm gonna email all of them you know <laughs> because they're so desperate um, to find people. I will also say that the job market right now is very very hot. So this is the time, if you're looking for a job, this is definitely the time to apply for jobs because everyone around the country is hiring. Uh, and our employers talk about how frustrated they are that they can't find enough candidates. They can't fill the roles that are out there. So this is a great time to be having this conversation um, about your career path and your career growth. But also if you're looking to make a move, if you're looking to, you know, increase your pay, you know, by changing jobs, whatever, this is the time to do it. I'm not giving you that advice from as a career builder employee. <laughs> just, I, I want to let you know that. But I am telling you that this is something that we do see out there is like the job market is very, very hot right now. I want to like put the disclaimer to not underestimate the power of building connections like how you're on this call tonight. Um, meeting people, building connections, getting your name out there and people knowing you because I know pretty much, I will say for most of the jobs that I've ever gotten, it's been connections have helped out where it's a person that I might know is like, hey, this is a good role for you. Or I saw something that's interesting. And some of these companies get thousands of resumes a day, hundreds of thousands of resumes. And if you know somebody, they can really get you to the top and really get you that push for jobs. So keep connecting, that really helps in the job search as well. Awesome, thank you. And Jen, did you wanna add anything before we close it out? Yeah, just don't, don't under, don't under, repeating, don't underestimate the power of connection. I think the only job that I've gotten in tech that was a cold call was my very first one. And I've had to make the connections to get the rest of them. We're all, here all but one of mine, all but one of mine were online, like no connection. So it depends. Yeah. 
I added my LinkedIn um, information out here for you guys. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to. I'd be happy to answer questions offline. Um, do be patient with me. Um, if I get a lot of um, questions from this um, call, it may take me some time to get back to you, but I definitely will try to get back to everyone who um, has questions that they want to ask. Well, thanks so much, Christopher. You're welcome. All right. Well, thank you all. Havana, did you, I'm just going to pass it back over to you. That was really yeah. awesome. Like there's so many questions that I'm so sorry that we couldn't get to all of them tonight, but Christopher has offered to be a resource if anybody wants to connect with, with him offline. Um, so yeah, this is, this is really awesome. Thank you guys so much. Round of applause for our speakers. Yes. Let's take ourselves off mute and yeah. Thank Gibberish you. in the chat means Woo! applause. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. That's thank really so cool. <laughs> and thank you so much, Keisha, for moderating. You did a great job. This was such, I mean, uh, our chat was popping. So <laughs> thank you so much for all the great questions. Feel free to connect with our speakers if you have follow-up questions or if we didn't get to get to your questions. I am so sorry. Um, Another final reminder before we log off, um, I want to, again, remind everyone to fill out the end of year survey. I'm about to drop it in the chat again. Go ahead and fill out that survey. If you've been attending, we would love to get your feedback in, in order to make 2022 even better. Um, and again, Thank you all the speakers who shared their wisdom and insights today. Feel free to connect with them and feel free to connect with the people that you met in the breakout rooms earlier tonight. As always, I uh, hope everyone has a great holiday season, a great new year, and thank you for coming. Uh, let's, uh, everyone, you can log off. Uh, let me stop the recording real quick.